Thank you very much. That's the first time I've been compared with Sachin Tendulkar. Um, I, I didn't know Raj Singh Dungapur very well, but every time I met him, I was struck by his friendliness, his charm, and his passion for cricket. And I'm delighted and likely and honoured to be asked to speak tonight and to be following the Nawab. My wife and I were both hoping to meet Tiger here, and it's so very sad that he died at what seems to me, from my vantage point, a very young age of 70. I don't think he would have known this, but we played against each other once when we were both in our teens, our mid or early teens, because during August in England, I played for a, a village team that went round the other villages, often very picturesque villages, and once we played at Wisborough Green. And the already distinguished Winchester schoolboy uh, turned out for them in the summer holidays. And my memory of that game is that our total tally for the day, that's his and mine, was approximately two, and that I outscored him. You should be able to work out how many he scored. Uh, and, but very soon after that, Petordi was spoken about in awe by people in England, I mean by professional cricketers in England, as a 19, 20-year-old Oxford and Sussex player, as the most brilliant young batsman they'd seen. And, of course, then he had the tragic accident, and as you've heard, this was followed by a courageous and extraordinary career. And so I would say he was known for his courage and his integrity, and his death is a tragic loss. Well, I wondered what to talk about tonight to you, and I thought that the most important issue in cricket at the moment is cheating. Not so much ordinary cheating, but the form of cheating that threatens the whole fabric of the game. Of course, I refer to match fixing and spot fixing. My own career, which finished in 1982, took place in a different epoch. I was never invited to throw a match or an innings, and indeed, I found it all too easy to get out without trying to. <laughs> and nor did I ever hear of matches being fixed. In this respect, our generation, Ian's, Bishon's, mine, were innocent. We were like the children in the Garden of Eden before the fall. People occasionally gesture to the notorious bet placed by Dennis Lilly and Rod Marsh on England to win the Headingley Test in 1981. But the laying of that bet had nothing whatever to do with match fixing. Rather, it was an opportunistic flutter by two inveterate tipsters when the odds offered in a two-horse race of 500 to 1 seemed to them absurd, despite the fact that by this time one of the horses, the English one, was lame, out of wind, and several miles behind the other. But the Australian horse managed not to win the match, in fact to lose it, and I think they won a few thousand pounds. But the idea of anyone being paid money by a bookmaker to underperform would have been unthinkable. It would have been laughed out of court. Well, it would never have got to court. Yet by the 90s, the bookmakers and their often criminal agents were tempting players, drawing them in and entrapping them. Some players succumbed, even became entrappers themselves and clearly still are succumbing. Such activities, as I say, are the major threat to the game, even if those involved are few, and one of the problems is none of us know how many there are. There may be very few, I hope there are. But any individual who engages in them, however apparently trivially, puts at risk not only his own career, but his profession 
and that of his colleagues and successors because fixing throws into doubt the integrity of the whole game. Everything becomes suspect. It's like a drop of poison in a vat of soup spreading infection throughout. Fixing is in a different category from common or garden cheating, such as claiming a catch when you know the ball has bounced, picking the seam, or using illegal substances on the ball, as we were once accused of doing in India. This ordinary cheating, and I'm, I'm actually an innocent about that occasion, maybe Bisham will tell me about it later, this ordinary cheating occurs within the framework of the game. Those who cheat in such ways are dishonest in order to gain an unfair advantage within the game by illegal or immoral means. The activities of this kind are continuous with, but different from, gamesmanship and cunning. But what Hansi Cronier, Salman Butt, Mohammed Azaruddin and others did is of a totally different order. Match fixing and spot fixing are not a matter of cheating within the game, but one might say cheating the game, cheating the fabric of it. In throwing a match or fixing a spot, these players undermine and falsify the whole activity. They cheat everyone, not just their opponents, but their own team, the public, and the game as an institution. The opponents are cheated because their victory becomes hollow their success devalued. The rest of their own team are cheated, those especially not in the know or not on the plot. They're cheated if their captain or one of their members is split in his allegiance to their success. The public is cheated and will rapidly become disillusioned if they find out or suspect that this kind of thing has gone on. How they ask themselves, can I trust any player or team if one of you had let me down in this way. The match fixer ill treats and treats with contempt everyone. One outcome is that any piece of poor cricket can become an occasion for raised and suspicious eyebrows. Whereas in fact we know, we, we have played cricket, that poor cricket happens from time to time without anyone trying to do it but no one can any longer be sure. And I'll just give you a small example of how the mistrust once in can't really get out. Now, as you know, and as was mentioned earlier, India didn't perform too well in England this year. Though against, I would say, the best England side or the best England squad that I've seen. For the final test at the Oval, uh, in the middle of August, with India 3-0 down, R.P. Singh was brought in. Now, I gather that he'd last played in a first-class match in January, and his first over to the two English left-handers included five balls down the leg side at a very gentle medium pace. Only one ball was anywhere near a good length or a line. A distinguished commentator made the following passing remark, a sort of throwaway remark. He said, anyone betting on balls down the leg side in the first over might have made some money. Now, as you'll appreciate, this was an almost explicit reference to the spot-fixing scandal of a year before at Lord's, when Mohammed Amir had bowled a wide down the leg side, first ball of the England innings, and later his two notorious no balls. For such, reason, for such reasons, People guilty of this kind of corruption should expect severe penalties and I support the call for strong action against them as well as every possible initiative of prevention including a range of educational measures including ongoing mentoring of players. Players, agents and others also need to know that there's a fair chance of detection. Whistleblowing should become an absolute duty on everyone in the game. At the same time, we need also to recognise that the pressure put on a young player by criminal bookies and their agents and by corrupt teammates can be appalling. As a result, 
some of those involved might need to be treated with compassion, especially if they admit their guilt and are willing to be enlisted in the battle against corruption. Deterrent and retributive justice needs to be tempered with mercy and discrimination is vital in sentencing and punishing. Like all secret organisations recruiting the naive for illegal activities, the criminals linked to gambling draw people in by involving them at first in activity that is in itself of minor importance, just as communist parties and other mafias the world over would use new recruits to run errands, thus exposing them to blackmail and threats. So the bookmakers and their henchmen first lure a cricketer by offering money and or approval for apparently innocuous information such as the nature of the pitch or the fitness of the players in their squads or other kinds of things. As Virgil put it in the Aeneid, it's easy the descent to hell as but a short step into criminality. And once in, threats against the player and his family may make it extremely difficult to get out. Thus, I would say, and I don't think the whole story has been told yet or can be told, 18-year-old Mohammed Amir was subject to pr pr pressure and was, I believe, uninterested in illegal financial gain and should, I think, have been and should now be treated much more leniently for his part in Pakistan's corruption than those who inveigled him into it. In the strenuous search for exemplary punishment, there has to be room for giving a misguided young player a second chance. It's impossible from the outside for any of us to have any notion about who might turn out to be guilty. I hear occasional rumours of players from international teams being corrupt, but I have no evidence and no means of knowing what to believe. The revelations that shook the whole world of cricket a decade ago involved a born-again Christian who conducted prayer meetings with his team before matches. When Hansi Kroni, the captain of South Africa, first denied everything, Ali Baka, the manager of the South African cricket, who'd worked closely with him for years, backed him, speaking of his unquestionable integrity and honesty. And one thing my work as a psychoanalyst, as well as being in psychoanalysis myself, has impressed on me is that one can never take human appearances for granted. It can sometimes be the case that the larger the front, the larger the behind. In Sports Mad South Africa, Cronje's good looks his excellent play as a batsman and captain and his apparent decency and honesty made him an ideal icon for the advertisers and for the sport. But he it was who stooped to serial dishonesty, even seducing the most junior players in his team to be his cronies. Crony was a fascinating example of the splits that occur in so many people. On the outside and in many of the contexts of his life, he was a decent, loving, honest and honourable man. But scratch the surface a bit far and you find this other self, his shadow self, corrupt, dishonest, devious, which even he himself might have been puzzled by. And I think we need to understand that people are often driven by motives and gratifications that occupy a separate place in their minds from that which guides their ordinary better selves. And I'm going to give you an example from Ian McEwan's brilliant novel, Solar, which was written in, in 2010. The main character in this novel is an overweight, alcoholic physicist called Michael Beard. And he arrives back at Heathrow from a trip to Berlin. And during the flight, in the morning, he's drunk champagne, a large gin and tonic, and three glasses of burgundy, and he's eaten everything that business class had to offer for lunch, including three bread rolls. All this barely two hours after a meaty Germanic breakfast. He's an hour and a half late for the talk 
that he's about to give for, as the author Riley comments, an unnaturally large fee on climate change at an energy conference at the Savoy, where he's expecting and awaiting yet another lunch. Further delayed in immigration, he, and now I'm going to quote from the novel, he crossed the departure hall fully aware that he was not quite taking a direct line to the stairs that led down to his train, nor was he quite aiming for the down at heel airport shop that sold newspapers, luggage straps and related clutter. Was he going to be weak and go in there as he always did? He thought not, but his route was bending that way. He was a public intellectual of a sort. He needed to be informed and it was natural that he should buy a newspaper, however pressed for time. At moments of important decision-making, the author goes on, the mind could be considered as a parliament, a debating chamber. Different factions contended. Short and long-term interests were entrenched in mutual loathing. Not only were motions tabled and opposed, certain proposals were aired in order to mask others. Sessions could be devious as well as stormy. Now Beard, Michael Beard, the character, buys four newspapers as if excess in one endeavour might immunise him in another. But at the last minute, as he handed them across for their barcodes to be scanned, he saw at the edge of his vision, in the array beneath the till, the gleam of the thing he wanted, the thing he did not want to want. A dozen of them in a line, and without deciding to, he was taking one, oh so light, and adding it to his pile. Now the it, in case you're wondering, was a, a bag of salt and vinegar crisps. And what defeated him, the author, author writes, was always the present, the moment of vivid confrontation with the infer affirming titbit, the extra course, the meal he didn't really need, when the short-term faction in his interior parliament carried the day. The image, this image of a person noticing that his footsteps are not taking quite a direct line to where in his better self he wants to go, the direct route to his appointment, but nor are they quite aiming for the sight of the alluring crisps. Seems to me a brilliant illustration of how the mind can be divided into two parts that pull this way and that with motivations from each side that would be foreign to those in the other half. Is this how it is for those tempted to fix matches or spots in matches at sport, in cricket? I suspect that few of them are as compulsive in their gambling as Michael Beard was towards ingestion. Few of them, I presume, find themselves at the mercy of the short-term faction in their divided inner worlds, drawn inexorably to the quick call on the mobile to the fixer, a compulsion similar to Michael Beard's bag of crisps. But I suspect there is a parallel in that the arguments used by the external tempters will be very like used by the in, those used by the internal ones, with the additional factor in illegal cricket gambling of threats both crude and subtle. We could imagine these weasel voices. It's only a small bag of crisps, so light. What difference would a no ball or two make? Or a wide in the second over? Or scoring less than two runs in the third? You've only got to do it once. If you go along with us this time, you're entirely free to opt out. We'll look after you. No one will know. Lots of people are doing it. Look, see for yourself some of those you admire most. How can it be wrong if so-and-so is drinking at the same bar? Or give us some information about the pitch, the weather, the makeup of the side for tomorrow. Nothing significant, just a guarantee of good faith. As Shakespeare put it, after describing how the expense of spirit and a waste of shame is lust in action, he says, all this the world well knows, yet none knows well to shun the heaven that leads men to this hell. As with other 
invasive weeds, there's no simple remedy, no guaranteed way of uprooting them for good. They tend to spread underground and they recur somewhere far from the first infestation. All one can do, I think, is work at it, do one's best, keep at it, refuse to ignore the problems or sweep them under the carpet. Match-fixing is run by criminals and it can produce fantastic profits with only a small fraction going to the players who get enlisted or corrupted. But it cannot happen without the players being inveigled in. I'm afraid I can't offer you a great deal of reassurance beyond the old slogan, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Thank you very much.